Hello, friends and students again. Nice to be with you. It's a beautiful spring day here in Vancouver, and the birds are coming to my bird feeder. My cat is happy. It's a nice day. I wanted to do a very brief posting because questions keep coming up. People email me questions. And uh, so, so I've gotten this question so many times that I thought, well, I'll just make a little posting about it. People are asking about low notes and um, how you produce them. Why certain people have good low notes and others don't. Now, this question seems to cross boundaries uh, with both baritones and basses. Sometimes we take it for granted that baritones are not supposed to have very low notes. Uh, and we know of our, our greatest of heroes, uh, Leonard Warren, had really no low notes. They were very tiny and very soft. But it's not uh, uncommon these days to also see a basso, claims to be a basso, but he doesn't have any low notes. And even historically, Shalyapin, who was more of a baritonal character in timbre at least, but even his range was more baritonal. Shaliapin had um, a good high F and F sharp. He did not have a high G. But in his day, a lot of baritone roles didn't require that. He, um, I'll take that back. In his youth, he had a high G. Because in his youth, he also sang the role of Valentin in Faust. And you have to have a good G for that, even if you take the aria down a whole step, you still have the trio you have to do, and there's no way you can transpose the trio down. So, he did have uh, good high notes as they adjudicated good high notes in Russia at the time. I don't think his high notes were ever up to standard for uh, Italian, but but uh, he didn't have, he had hardly any low notes. And you'll hear him sing standard bass or is like in Felice, and when the passage goes down to a low A flat, he just almost disappears. And you'll occasionally hear him try to sing a low G, and it's just a bunch of fog rattling around. So he was a, a bass who didn't really have any low notes. But most of the great basses we expect to have a low F or a low E. Anything below that is gravy. Now, Siepi had a wonderful low C. There's no doubt about that, but I don't recall him ever using it on stage. Uh, the one Italian basso cantante who did have a thunderous low voice um, <laughs> and sang the sang the Inquisitor quite a lot, was Giulio Neri. And he had all the basses of his day beaten. He sang in the 40s at the Rome Opera and began to sing internationally in the late 40s. He had a brief career because he, he, he uh, died early I believe it was from an aneurysm in the brain. And Siepe said, if he had lived, he would have put us all out of business. So that's how great Giulio was. 
but not just for his low notes, which were tremendous, but for great high notes. His high F would shake mountaintops. So he was really the perfect bass for the dramatic roles that the basso cantante was just perhaps a little light for. Take, for example, uh, La Gioconda. And uh, we're accustomed to hearing Siepe sing the bass role of Alvise. And he's very beautiful, but it's just not quite uh, dramatic enough, really. And you listen to Giulio Neri do the part, and it's really satisfying. So, my point is, among baritones and basses, even among basses, everybody is asking how to get their no low notes better. Heinz told me, confidentially, that he was always self... Uh, he always thought that other people had better low notes than him. And he was uh, self-conscious about it. He always had a crazy idea that his low notes were no good. And it, I tried to tell him his low notes were terrific. And uh, I vocalized with him, of course, many times since he was my teacher. And he would vocalize first and vocalize his bass, bass voice clear down to low B flat below low C. And I said to him, what in the world do you mean when you tell me that you don't have any good low notes? You just went down to a low B flat. And he said, yeah, well, uh, I, I couldn't do it on stage. And I thought to myself, you wouldn't accept that answer from any other student. So why do you accept that answer for you? And he went through the list of all the bases at the Metropolitan who he thought had better low notes than him. And I shook my head at every turn. You know, they don't. And I said to him, who has sung Sirostro at the Met more than any other base? And he was sort of sheepish and said, well, I guess it's me. Yeah. He sings a rostrum more than any other bass at the Met. And it's quite obvious why they selected him for it. His physique, six foot twos, I mean six foot six and a half, and that thunderous voice of his, which had such authority and such beautiful quality in the low notes. And yet he never developed the technique for being at home with his low notes. Let me explain it to you, and then I'll give some demonstration of some sort. So, the larynx needs less airflow when you are going down the scale to, to the lowest notes in your voice. I'll go, let me say that again. The low notes in your voice need the least air pressure. If you try to push a bunch of air pressure in your low notes, you will just have a, a growl or you will have some sort of push tone that is not acceptable. <coughs> It's not going to be acceptable. Okay. So you have to find a way to allow the voice to relax down the scale. And as you go down the scale towards your lowest notes, you have to give up on the idea of making them loud because you can't. The loudness of the voice is on what we call um, an even intensity scale, which means 
the low notes have the least intensity, and as you rise up the scale, the upper notes gain in intensity until finally the highest note that's natural in your voice has the greatest intensity. So it is absolutely impossible to take that intensity that's natural in the top and to put it down on the low notes. Just think in your mind now how inhuman it would sound if someone could blast a low E and it was as loud as, say, their high F sharp or their high G. It wouldn't sound like a human being. We expect the voice, by nature, to become less intense as we go down the scale. So what you should be concentrating on as you go down the scale is to keep them rounded, stay bena pojata with the diaphragm supporting the, the air that's in the lungs. You must maintain the feeling of air in the lungs rather than give it up. And as you go down the scale, as you relax into the low notes, keeping them round, you'll have whatever volume is natural for you to have. Most basses don't have tremendously loud low notes because it would require a very special and rare kind of larynx which had very long and very thick vocal cords. Someone who did that was a, uh, a studio singer named Thurl Ravenscroft. And he was the voice for Tony the Tiger and Mr. Grinch. And uh, he had sung classical music in a choir. For many years, the famous Norman Luboff Choir had only one second bass in the whole department. One second bass had about six or eight first bases, one second bass. That's all they needed. It was Thurl Ravenscroft. And he alone put out those big low notes that sometimes the Luboff arrangements would call for. But he had very limited usage for that voice. Because they were so long and so thick, he really could not use them and sing very high, and he didn't have the technique to keep the same quality in the voice as he went up the scale. So it was like, you know, you had his three or four low notes, and that was it. Now, my voice was a Verdi baritone with unusual extensions. And that corresponds to some characteristics of some larynges that are highly flexible. In my youth, when I still had cartilage instead of bone, because everyone from the age 40 to 80 goes through a process called ossification, where every cartilage in the body is gradually turning to bone. Now that affects the larynx an enormous amount because it's all cartilage except for the hyoid bone at the base of the, uh, of the tongue. The hyoid bone is the only bone in the body that's not attached to any other bone. It's there at the top of the larynx and the horns of the thyroid extend up to it and the tongue extends on the other side from it. But the larynx itself, the vibratory larynx, is all cartilage. There's the cricoid cartilage that it sits on. There's the thyroid cartilage that houses the true vocal folds. There are the there are the, there is the arytenoid cartilages in back that 
the vocal folds connect to and which open and close the vocal cords, it's all cartilage. And if you have uh, a good larynx, when you're young, that cartilage will be so supple that the whole larynx can contort itself into different shapes according to the tone you're requesting of it. So that is one of the difficulties in maintaining your voice when you get to be older. C cartilage is very supple. Bone is not. And some of the requirements for relaxing down into the low notes have to do with the cartilage effect of the, the whole at larynx. Occasionally we'll hear uh, an older singer who still has his low notes, but it's very rare. Now Jerry Hines was a, was a health nut. He was a chemist and he knew what to take. He took every day a variety of his own concoctions. He only drank distilled water. He fasted twice a week. And for three months every year, he did nothing but scuba dive because he owned a home in the Dutch West Antilles on Bonaire. And uh, every summer... The Met was out, of course. Every summer, his whole family would journey to the Dutch West Antilles, uh, and on Bon Air, they would have a great time all summer scuba diving in those beautiful waters. You want to know what would keep you in shape, keep yourself limber? It's some sort of athleticism which you could add to your normal, uh, uh, your normal vocal exercises and your normal physical exercises. Well, Heinz had the greatest one, scuba diving, for three months a year. It was like training to come back into the fall season at the Met. So he maintained his whole range down to low E, that's where he stopped, except during his vocalization. I kept saying, Jerry, go on down. They're down there. He said, no, I can't do it on stage. But he could have. He vocalized every day down to low B flat, and it didn't sound like a growl either. It wasn't a vocal fry. It was a real note. So... As a Verdi baritone, I was never called on much to have low notes, but in certain periods, I could extend my voice and I would pick up those lower notes uh, that would be useful for bass baritone or bass, and I would be able to sing crossover uh, one of those roles. But they were fair weather friends. They, they weren't there all the time. Likewise, on the other side, uh, when I was young, and still to a certain extent today, my head voice could be extended much higher than the normal Verdi baritone so that I could even sing tenor parts, uh, at least briefly. I never tried to do one on stage. But... I had a high C and normally a high D. Now that's very, very, very rare for a baritone. Uh, people say that Warren had a high C. No one ever heard him sing a high D. So these were things that were little giftings in my instrument. But I did have low notes during those episodes when I could extend the voice downward. And if you know, wanted to, if you want to know what they sounded like, they sounded like this.
There was the Grand Inquisitor. There wasn't any trouble at that particular time. Now, these little episodes would come over me, usually after some great relaxation. And I could always count on, I don't want this to get a little too racy, but I could always count on sex to temporarily give me a few extra low notes. So uh, I, I played my low notes when they were there as well as I could. But the only time I ever really tried to sing a bass part on stage and didn't really have it well was when I tried to play uh, Pizarro and Fidelio. <clears throat> and normally I could have sung that, but we were high up on top of a mountain, so the air was thin, and I had just caught a cold the day I arrived. And so I had to take all sorts of antihistamines by the handfuls to try to dry up the mucus because I was sneezing like a crazy man. And so the, I got the voice dried up so that I wasn't sneezing, but it also dried out my low voice. So there I went back to rehearsals and sang most of the role just fine, except the low notes weren't there normally, and so I wasn't able to get them over the orchestra. Most of the time when I sang one of these bass baritone parts, I was able to use my natural voice and get the low note out some way. For example, uh, I did uh, Haydn's creation, both the bass part of Raphael and the baritone of Adam. And let me tell you, you do both of those roles in the same production, if you're doing all of the all of the oratorio and we were it becomes the longest night you have ever had on stage unless maybe you've sung some Wagner but even then you know Telramont was in Lohengrin which I did was about 45 minutes of music where I was singing but now in the Haydn creation I was singing a lot longer than that. And so I was going to need the low notes for the role of Raphael, and uh, I needed an agility in the high voice to do Adam. So uh, I um, had the help of <clears throat> a certain lady friend and... Uh, we did a few hmm, exercises right before I went to the performance, and I was able, lo and behold, to have those low notes. So I'm not advising you to go out and become a sex maniac to get more low notes. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to tell you that there is a feeling that's required of relaxing the voice down into the low notes, giving up any idea of making them loud by pushing against them. That will ruin them. It will ruin all of the lower partials, and it will make the voice sound like a pressed tone, like someone who doesn't really have the note. And if you do that, if you sing properly, just rounding and relaxing the voice, you'll find your natural bottom. And unless you have certain tricks, like I did, it's best to cast your rolls with your natural range. So my voice naturally always had a, a low A and a low G, so I could cast rolls that went down to those two. Even Renato in Un Ballon Mascara has to sing that low A at the end, at the middle of Eri Tu. And it's a 
bad spot because the vocal cords are very tense from exercise in chest voice where you've just been singing and now all of a sudden on that passage of Eleni, you have to quickly relax out the vocal cords from all of that stiffness. So you want to re really retard on that. Of Eleni, Parma. And otherwise, you're going to find yourself going, Of Eleni, Parma. And that's the way most people, most baritones, sing their lonos. Don't do it. It's much better just to let them roll out with maybe a couple of less decibels, but have shape. And they're only going to carry as well as the theater is constructed anyway. If you're singing in a barn, nothing's going to carry anyway, but the notes that are over middle C. And unfortunately, Americans have to sing in the crudest constructions, uh, barns, or convention centers, uh, or that were never, ever intended for music. Now, at the Metropolitan Opera, it is, it is built so perfectly. The sides of the orchestra seating the downstairs sides of the walls are from African teak wood, which, which, out of which are made the finest cellos. So the tone that goes out gets amplified naturally by the partials which hit the teak wood and then are given extra bounces to the other sides of where they meet teak wood again, and then they're bounced again. And the, the uh, effect of that is, if you know this, you can use it. You can sing. And many people who sing there, their whole career told me this. And I've sung on that stage, and I agree. You can sing a whole fuck heavier at the Met than you could sing any place else in American uh, regional theater where they have these lousy constructed halls. I was doing Lohengrin in regional opera, uh, the part, the Helden baritone part of, of Friedrich von Telramont. It was a good part for me. It was high. My upper partial is carried right over the orchestra. But the bass has got a very difficult role of King Henry. And the guy who was playing King Henry with me, a dear friend, I'm not going to use his name. I don't want to, you know, embarrass him. And he's passed over now, so he's passed away. I don't want to use his name. But at any rate, he was a great bass. Uh, he was Metropolitan Opera Bass, and his voice was so good, he was the first cover for Jerry Hines, and that says a lot. But he had done great work at the Met and at New York City Opera before that. He was a terrific bass, and he had great low voice down to low C, and a good enough high voice up to F. Um, so he was King Henry for this production. But the tessitura of King Henry was so high that it tested his technique, which was not perfect. The bass voice normally covers around a D or an E flat above middle C. And by covering, I've already explained that in another posting on how to sing. It is the entrance of the, of the bass to the brief head voice, which the bass voice has. 
Normally the bass voice has a very small head register of D, E flat, E natural, F, maybe F sharp. Not very many basses had a high G. Heinz did a thunderous high G, but not many great basses did. Flagello did. Sieppe didn't. He didn't sing anything above a high F sharp. So my point in this is that this fellow playing King Henry did not have a good technique for singing that high tessitura, and he, result, he resorted to allowing his larynx to raise up higher as he went up for the higher notes. That is disaster waiting to happen. Because when the larynx rises, it shuts down the throat. The throat is closed. And the only muscles that work on the larynx, when you pull it up like that, are swallowing muscles, which are designed to batten down the hatches to close the larynx so that food will not fall into it, and to squeeze the larynx so that food would not come into it. That's why they're called the constrictor muscles. Their job is to really tie the larynx down so no food is going to get in your trachea and make you choke, maybe choke to death. So you can't sing using the swallowing muscles. You cannot sing with using the muscles which elevate the larynx because they're all swallowing muscles. There are no other neutral muscles in there to kindly raise your larynx. You're not made that way. And you don't have any horizontal muscles, any curtain rods you can stick in there to keep the lower part of the pharynx open. It's only the, as a result of the larynx lowering that the side wall tissues at the base of the pharynx are expanded. Mm -hmm. And then it expands. So you let the larynx raise, you lose the open throat, you lose the open throat, you lose all of your texture, you lose your tone. And this poor guy who was a close friend of mine, and I love him to death, he was using this approach to get through the high tessitura of King Henry. Now, I think the conductor had a few words with him, but it didn't do any good. So finally, this guy, I, I need a name for him that won't discuss, disclose who he was. Let's call him Pete. It's not his name. So, the, uh, the night of final dress rehearsal, Pete was in the wings, in costume, as King Henry, and he made a motion to the conductor. Come here, come here, come here. I need to speak with you. And the conductor is a nice guy, Jim Sullivan, very nice man, and a fine conductor. Never got his, never got the applause he should have had. So he comes up there and he listens to Pete, and Pete is all in an uproar, and he says, "You bring that." orchestra down in volume or I am going to walk off the stage and refuse to sing the rest of the role. Huh? Okay. And he was, my God, Pete got mad and we'd never seen him get mad. He was in a tizzy. He was in a panic. And we all thought it was because of the high notes. And it wasn't. It was because of the low notes. Here a man who was famous for having great low notes was still self-conscious that he would not be able to sing them as King uh, Henry because he has to go so high and then go so low. And so for Mein Herr Gott, 
he would use that elevator larynx technique up to the top notes, and then he'd try to re-engineer the voice to drop down to the low F. And sometimes it wasn't working for him. So he was pretty scared. And the conductor was a nice guy. I mean, a lot of conductors would have fired him on the spot. And if we had had a first cover for him, I think they would have fired him. But we didn't have a first cover, so we had to make him at ease as possible. And the conductor said, don't worry, it's fine. I'm on your side. Okay, I'll bring the orchestra way down for Mein Herr und Gott. And you take your time on the getting into those low Fs. There, it'll all be fine. And he was trying to play nursemaid to Pete. So Pete said, oh, okay. And he went on. And he got through the first monologue just fine. He got through uh, most of the first act just fine. Until finally it all goes into and swells into Mein Herald Gott. And he did the first part of it fine. And then he got to where he had to go down to the low F. And he did pretty good relaxing his voice. He did what you need to learn instinctively to do. So he relaxed his voice very quickly and made that low F sounded sound like some instrument in the orchestra had made it. It was so round and so beautiful. Well, after that, he relaxed, and he sang a terrific King Henry, and the whole Lohengrin was a tremendous success. So I give you that only as a, an example about what I'm trying to instill in you, that you must relax the voice as you go down the scale and give up all ideas of pushing it to make it louder. It's not going to be any louder and you're going to ruin it in its texture. And it will be heard if you're in a theater that's designed for music. If it's in a convention hall that's not designed for music, no one's going to hear it even if you have a microphone. Now, knock wood, I hope to God that never happens. But the mics are here. Here at our little opera company in Vancouver, the mics are there. And I've been told in other opera companies, the mics are there. What, did we, what should we have expected in this kind of era where you have tiny little voices, voices that we would not allow in my day to sing Chonard or now singing Rigoletto and Macbeth and everything. And it's a travesty. It's an utter travesty of the loss of the heritage of opera. And I could go into that in more detail, but I already have some postings on the death of opera, so we won't go into that any further. So if I had a keyboard here, I would vocalize you from, say, uh, a G below middle C, and vocalize you going down to that low G and see if you can experience relaxing the voice going down. And then if you get down there, take a relaxed breath and see if you can begin with that relaxed low G and see if there's any more bottom that comes up. Now, if a vocal fry is good enough, you can use it. I think Siepe's low C was really a fry. Giulio Neri's was not, let me tell you. But I believe Siepe's was. But it was a beautiful fry. And there was absolutely no reason in the world why he shouldn't have used it. If you don't know this register terminology, we normally speak of chest register, chest voice, head register, head voice for men, 
Women have a, a third one. They have chest, middle, and head. And then on top, they have an extra one uh, called whistle register, if they have that. And men sometimes have an extra register below chest voice, which we normally call vocal fry register or pulse register. And it's even rarer than whistle voice. So some of these low notes that I sang, that I recorded off one day when I, I was feeling really good, the lowest ones are, fr are fry. The low A flat that I sang, I believe it's the low A flat, that was fry. But it was such a good fry, I could have used it on stage had I wanted to. Certainly there was nothing wrong with my sire for the Grand Inquisitor. I could have done that role. That day, that time, or that period, that month, however long it was, when I had an extra extension on the low voice. And again, they sounded like this. <laughs> That's a low E, that all of the basses quiver and quake about whether they're going to be able to hit it. When my low notes were there, as you can see, it was absolutely no difficulty for me at all. But I really was a baritone, and so those notes were fair weather friends. They were there on some days and not on others. But my head voice is totally the opposite. It was so natural to me. I was there all the time. I never had to worry about it. And one of the reasons I had so much energy to put into the character on stage was the fact that I never had to worry about the voice. I never had to think about how to produce the voice. I never had to worry if the voice was there. In 35 years of singing on stage, I only cracked a note twice. You say, well, you cracked. Yeah, well, most people, I guarantee you, in 35 years, crack a lot more than twice. Pavarotti cracked so many times that they refused to allow him to sing in Parma anymore. And the last time he was there and cracked, they threw tomatoes at him. Corelli certainly cracked a lot more than twice. He was so nervous he was going to crack that he wouldn't go on stage unless in the wings he had his wife, his poodle, his doctor, and his priest. They all had to be there or he wouldn't go out on stage. You talk about someone who's afraid of cracking. I was never afraid of cracking. It was just a couple of couple of times I made a mistake and it cracked. Big deal. Then I went on singing. But for many people, the fear of cracking is because your technique is not good enough and you cannot rely on the voice. You can't trust it on stage. And so you've got a lot of attention going into what's needed for vocal production. You don't have a big enough hard drive up here to put the attention you need to into character. So my advice to you is to work like the devil on your technique until finally you don't have to think about technique of singing when you're on stage. It can be done. It can be mastered. Okay, so I hope that I've given you my point, which is you, do, you find your natural low notes by relaxing the voice as you go down the scale. What you're really relaxing, if these two fingers may be thought of as the vocalis muscles of the vocal fold, you're relaxing the vocalis muscles. They, especially if you've been singing higher, 
they remember, they have memory, they remember the sensation that they're in when you're singing in chest voice or for women if you've been singing high notes. So it's quite an exercise to find out how it feels like to relax them in a hurry. And basses, baritones, usually you're given enough time in the way that the artist has written it, enough time to begin that relaxation so that you can accomplish it. Think of uh, Amonastro's entrance. I uh, don't have my pitch pipe right here. But I think it's so padre. And then you have Anch'io poniai Venti noi fumo That's already giving you a chance to begin to think of relaxing the chords. And then you go Morten bon charcai You've got a chance to relax down into it by the way the note has been written. And if you're wise, you'll take advantage of that. But too often, too many baritones are, begin that nervousness even at the beginning and they overblow on Suo Padre and the rest of it. If you overblow you won't be able to relax the chords enough. And we've heard all these, even great baritones. Giuseppe Taddei never had a low A. So he would do things, I swear this is a good imitation. <laughs> he had to figure out how to make some sort of sound, but it wasn't really a note. And uh, plenty of baritones have been empty of voice when they reach down there for it. There's no excuse. It's your opening. You've been uh, vocalizing in backstage in your in your dressing room, and that's your entrance. The king says, "Don and you answer him. So padre, anche io poniai venti noi fumo morten bon charcai. And you get something out there. My low notes are not there anymore because I take medication for my heart and it dries out the vocal cords. But you get the idea. No more will I ever have those beautiful low notes I played for you there because the medication I take keeps me alive. It's too bad it also dries my voice out. Uh, but there's always something. So have we got that? Relax the voice as you go down the scale for the low notes. Make the low notes as round as possible. Take your time. See how the music gives you time to relax those internal thyroid muscles, those vocalis muscles, so that you're able to have loose, long vocal folds that are required for the low notes. Okay? Bye for today.